while Chris is gone, I'll show you my cool Howard Zinn mug that was gifted to me by a friend in Iowa City at the Teach, Teach Truth Day event that was there. It's Howard Zinn Centennial 1922-2022, and then it reads on the back, History should emphasize new possibilities by disclosing those hidden episodes of the past when people showed their ability to resist, to join together, and to occasionally win. Hello? There he is. So today, we're going to talk about the legacy of Chaim Ganat, which I believe I'm pronouncing correctly. If you know, feel free to absolutely correct us. We stumbled across Ganat's work, I want to say maybe one or two years ago. I, I don't even know how this came about, but I randomly ended up with a copy of Teacher and Child after, I believe, stumbling across a quote from him uh, that we had read in, in, in something. But I was just kind of shocked that like, I came across this guy and it was really powerful work. And I had no idea who he was, and I've never met anyone who knows who he is. Right. He was a child psychologist. What I have on the screen here, this is sadly his um, obituary. I, I think Haim Ganat is probably maybe potentially more well-known in Israel, which is where he grew up. But he was relatively popular in the States. You can see here he was the resident psychologist on the Today Show. Um, and oh, he wrote a weekly syndicated newspaper column, which was in the U.S., Europe, and Israel called Between Us. And he's probably best well known for parent uh, education and helping raise kids as opposed to necessarily just teaching. But those things tend to go hand in hand. He kind of reminds me as if Alfie Cohn lived in the 1950s and 1960s. There's a lot of similarities between Alfie Cohn's style of student connectedness and caring about kids and kind of critiquing the system and what Haim Ganat's doing about 20, 30 years earlier. His death at age 51, it says here, was in 1973. So, I mean, that even that was, well, 50 years ago, right? So mm -hmm. um, he, he died a long time ago. He died relatively young. Had he lived longer, I feel like he would have become one of those household names. You know, 51 at, in this kind of career, given the things that he was doing, it's both fascinating, but again, a, a tragedy, as you said, because Gannat wrote three books. He wrote two books on parenting, which landed him those gigs doing the, the syndicated column and being on the Today Show. And he was a relatively household name for parenting. But the book that we're primarily going to focus on today, Teacher and Child, was published just a year before his death. This comes from a letter that Gannat received. I am a survivor of a concentration camp. My eyes saw what no person should witness. Gas chambers built by learned engineers, children poisoned by educated physicians, infants killed by trained nurses, women and babies shot by high school and college graduates. So I am suspicious of education. My request is this. Help your children become human. Your efforts must never produce learned monsters, skilled psychopaths, or educated Eichmanns referring to Adolf Eichmann, the architect of the Holocaust. Reading, mm -hmm. writing, and arithmetic are important only if they serve to make our children more human. And for us, we like to reference this quote in relation to the idea that knowledge is just not some inert thing that's out there. And right, it's not enough just to teach kids reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's only important to do those things if we can do that in the service of humanity, or as this author says, to make our children more human. There's no purpose of education if education is only about knowledge production, because even if we're not in a state of outright genocide, there still are a lot of people suffering that the world could be improved for, many of whom are in our classrooms. And this is happening in a twofold process. The first is just by how you treat kids, which I think Heim, Heim Gannat is primarily focused on student relationships, which is what we're talking about here today. There's also the element of systemic change in classrooms to make teachers less authoritarian, to share more power with students, and to operate classrooms that you're not just being nice to kids to get them through a dehumanizing system, but you're changing the system itself so that everyone benefits. I think about, I just happen to have on my, my desk here, um, culture, in the, culture and Power in the Classroom by Antonia Darter which is about using critical pedagogy to create liberatory classrooms, or of course, um, like bell hooks, teaching to transgress. So this is a summary of his work to never deny or ignore a child's feelings, 
only the behavior is treated as unacceptable, never the child, which I was taught this in like when I was getting my education degree, uh, right, that you right. never want to call out a kid. You want to call out the thing that the kid is doing depersonalize negative interactions by only mentioning that problem for example i i see a messy room instead of nick the room is messy <laughs> uh attach rules to things little sisters are not for hitting i love that example okay. dependence breeds hostility let children do for themselves what they can and kind of building on that children need to learn to choose but within the safety of limits for example would you like to wear this blue shirt or this red one Right. That to me is, I mean, it's self-determination theory, um, yeah. diving into kids. A, a huge part of Gannat's work that we'll find is the more kids are reliant on you, the more they dislike you and the less likely that they are going to not only listen to you, but actually want to do things for you to begin with. In like the school context, what I heard so much because I taught at high school, what I heard so much in the building was this idea of learned helplessness, right? That kids mm -hmm. can't do anything for themselves because they've learned that adults will just do it for them. And that's not an indictment of the kids and their behavior. That's an indictment of the adults in the system, right? We let them um, get to this point because, right, frankly, it's more efficient if kids are dragging their feet, they're behind or whatever, just, just do it for them to move them to the next part and whatever. Well, then they're, they're not actually then developing and practicing those executive skills that are going to allow them to make better decisions in the future. But with, with my eight-year-old, we do that exact same thing, right? We provide some choices within a range of things to say like, hey, you know, what shorts do you want to wear? Provide some choices for him. What socks? What shirts? And he can kind of pick and choose his outfit from amongst those choices. Yeah. So while you were talking, I was, I was considering this study, which it, it's titled Less Structured Time, and it's open access, which is nice. You can find it on our website. Less Structured Time in Children's Daily Lives Predicts self-directed executive functioning and you can see here why do children often forget or outright refuse to put on a coat before leaving the house on a snowy day the simple decision arises from a complex interplay of behaviors children must keep in mind a goal for example staying warm that is not yet relevant in the comfort of a warm house and therefore they have to go through like the sequence of tasks and they they don't want to do it and they talk about how you need to give kids the option to figure those things out on their own Otherwise, they begin to rely on you. And not only does that break down the relationship between family member and child, but it also limits, and they study this, it limits their executive functioning because they never actually figured out for themselves how to actually do this stuff. Our findings offer support for a relationship between the time children spend in less structured and structured activities and the development of self-directed executive function. Children who spent more time in less structured activities displayed better self-control even after controlling for age, verbal ability, and household income, and then the opposite was found as well. This should be obvious. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that, that is common sense, but it's completely against, and I pulled up this as well. It's just like a random Google search, but I, I don't know about you, but I heard this so many times when I was teaching. Kids crave structure. So you have to have all of this structure in place because kids, especially from marginalized communities, have to have a lot of structure in their environment. And I think that this is a misnomer because it's, it's falsely interpreted. Did you hear this a lot when you were teaching? It just gets caricatured to mean like a more repressive style of like disciplinarian style of teaching or parenting even, you know, a more authoritarian mm -hmm. style of parenting. Um, and I think really what it's referring to is what it really means that kids need structure. They, they need consistency. They need reliability. They need structures and routines, but they need to have a say in what those things look like. Every time I've ever seen someone talk about kids crave structure, they're actually referring to a more militant style of teaching where kids are being kind of forced through the motions through bell ringers and time tasks and and exit tickets, which any of those things can be fined on its own. It's just when that becomes systematized to the point where kids never actually do anything on their own at all. And in a classroom setting, I think the reason why we tend not to find that is because of efficiency. Yeah, that process of asking a kid, figuring out the figuring out what's going on, figuring out their emotion, pausing what it is that you're doing requires a lot of time. 
And in the stress we face as teachers to get through all of the content and the fact there's so many kids in the room, it becomes really difficult to slow down and do that. I mean, that's ostensibly restorative justice going through, uh, uh, yes. you know, going through that conversation, going through that process. I like this last one here, too. I mean, the, yeah. the, the last two, but refrain from using words that you would not want the child to repeat. I, that that um, makes any well, parent yeah. knows that this is the case. I, this, but this last one, I think, is is perfect. And it contrasts with. I, even when I was classroom teaching, I had heard from administrators, I had heard them reference like this broken windows idea of policing, which mm. is the notion that all of these little things add up to add up to this big culture um, shift where when you accept these small uh, discrepancies or these small behavioral things, then it's going to lead to these bigger problems down the line. And this post here is from the Uncommon Truth on Instagram, yeah. which we referenced in our Teach Like a Champion video, which is yeah. taking this idea of broken windows policing um, to its extreme at places like Uncommon Schools, where there is no sweating the small stuff. It is a constant surveillance, constant behaviorism. It's really the complete opposite of this entire bulleted list. So I have looked and scoured the internet for where these clips are from. There are only, I believe, two videos of Heim Gannat totally. There's this video for, that's in black and white, and then there's a video that's in color, and that's about it. And all of these have comments that say, what's the source of this? And no one ever replies. Oh, I can assume that since he was a regular correspondent on the Today Show, that these are probably clips from the Today Show. Although I'm neither strict nor permissive, I am strict when it comes to undesirable behavior. I am permissive when it comes to feelings. In other words, the, my, the basic approach is that if you are strict or you are permissive, you'll make a mess of the children. It's not that simple. However, the modern approach to children is to make a basic distinction between feelings and acts. When it comes to feelings, we are permissive. In other words, you can feel and desire and want and dream of whatever you want. It's really a free country because it's symbolic. It's symbolic behavior. But when it comes to undesirable behavior, this is where we become strict. I'll give you an example of what I mean by permissiveness and strictness. Uh, a child comes into an ice cream parlor and he says to, I want seven ice creams. Now let's see, suppose if you say I'm strict, you know, you say seven ice creams, you're crazy or something? You want to be sick? You want to vomit? You remember how what happened to you last time? You couldn't go to school and you were, we had to call a doctor and money doesn't grow on trees and it costs so much? You're a bad boy. Or Suppose you are permissive, so to speak, foolishly permissive, and you say, you want seven ice cream? Okay, you have seven ice cream, you'll vomit on your own time, <laughs> and you'll learn from your experience. You remember, you brought it up. Now, neither of them is certainly what an what a, uh, intelligent person would do. However, there's a third way, and the third way is, I look at a child and I say, he says, I want seven ice creams, and I said, you like ice cream, huh? He says, yeah. I said, you wish you had a whole ice cream parlor for yourself, he says, yeah. I said, if you had it, you could have ice cream for the morning, ice cream for the afternoon, ice cream for the evening. You would have ice cream, all the 28 flavors. He says, yeah. <laughs> and then I said, but you can have only two. Now, but you choose which two you want. Now, what did I do? I was very permissive as far as what? As far as his feelings was. He can, he can wish he could have all the ice cream in the world. And then I decide that he can have only two because it's undesirable for him to have seven ice creams. Now, was I permissive or was I strict? Both. Permissive when it comes to desires and to feelings and to wishes. Strict when it comes to what? To undesirable behavior. There's a way to, again, validate the things kids might want to do or inquire about why they might want to do them, but then co-create with them a space where they can feel like they'll have that need met in a, in a small way that you can make possible given time given resources i think the first thing that came to mind for me was cell phone policy 
I, I don't like the idea of banning cell phones entirely because I okay. think it doesn't teach you the responsibility of having a cell phone. It's conversations about kids at the beginning of the year and really throughout the year uh, of when they can have their cell phones out and when they shouldn't. But it's not just saying, don't have your cell phone out right now. It's explaining to them why we have it out at certain points and not at other points. For example, if the teacher is talking and explaining something, probably not a good time to be on your phone because I'm going to have to re-explain the instructions to you. But it's not like I'm getting angry at the kids. I'm explaining to them the process of why we're doing it in this way. But you have a theory, which is, un at least it was the first time I heard it, and, and it's now something that people have begun to accept more, which at the, now Hold seems on. illogical. And at the Pause time, it. seems very... Is that Barbara Walters? Man, it looks like Barbara Walters. Look at those two images. Steve Allen, Barbara Walters, Dr. Heim Gannat, 1973 on the, on the Merv Griffin, Griffin Show. Wow. So that's, the, that's where this is from. Oh, wow. You There's just the, solved the, the, a YouTube riddle, Chris. I know. I can reply. I see these videos. Can you let me know where you found them? I can mm. reply to all these people that are asking where it's from. Well, we, you, you just figured it out. That's Barbara and, Walters. Sign in and type in that reply, like in this video. How long ago was this written? This was from 10 years ago. <laughs> it's turned around and he turned over some uh, a glass of, of water. My natural response without thinking spontaneously would be, oh, the water spilled, here is a sponge. Now, the principle that I use is don't say anything to the child about himself. Do not attack his character. Do not attack his personality. Do not attack his dignity. The principle is, here is the problem, here is the solution. Parents, because of their own upbringing, have a native tongue of rejection, a native tongue of attack. And what we try to do now is to give them another language. And this is a language of compassion and a language of caring. After all, it's as easy to say to a child, the milk spilled, here is a sponge. By the way, parents know it especially when guest comes. Have you ever seen when a guest comes to your home and spills, shall we say, a glass of wine? Would you say to him, listen, next time, if you do it once more, <laughs> you're never going to be invited. Right? That's the last time that you are in our home. Besides, uh, where were you brought up? In the jungle? Yeah. <laughs> That's where you belong, you know. Somehow, to guests, we don't talk like this. I always ask parents, what would you do if a, a guest came to your home and forgot, shall we say, uh, his umbrella? Would you say to him, every time you come to our home, you forget something. <laughs> if it's not one thing, it's another. We used to have a classroom set of cleaning resources because there's nothing worse than if a kid does spill something or makes a mess or like is eating chips or something and gets it everywhere of just getting mad at the kid and then calling down the janitor to clean it up for them because that not only harms the kid because they can't fix their own problem, but it also just pisses the janitor off. Um, so I, I always was trying to get in like, why is there not a classroom or like a shared classroom vacuum cleaner? That disempowerment, as, as we saw in Gannat's quote there, leads to that resentment. And the opposite is true. The empowerment leads to agency. So kids begin to realize that they do have control over themselves. And so it really, instead of being a vicious cycle where attacks on the kid uh, attacks on dignity, attacks on whatever, internalize and become, you know, oh, I am a dumb klutz, you know, um, actually mm -hmm. becomes a virtuous cycle where they say, okay, I realize I, you know, um, lost control. I can clean this thing up. I could apologize. I can make amends. I can do better next time. It really just changes that whole thing around. You can tell why he made it on television. He really is a charismatic kind of like electrifying entertaining dude to listen to he, he's not like a dry psychoanalyst psychologist person when i get angry at a child and i get angry often what i do is i hurl at a child values instead of insults who says i have to say you are such an idiot uh and he can answer why of course you're my father <laughs> you know <Yeah. laughs> It's like, it's like the, the, the father, the, the little boy, uh, the father who said to the boy, you eat like a pig, you know what a pig is? And the child said, sure, the son of a swine. You know. <laughs> uh, but when I get angry at a child, I have no difficulty expressing myself. Well, you know what I do? I say to the child, I use the word I instead of the word you. 
Instead of saying, you're such a pest, you're such an idiot, you're so stupid. Where were you when they distributed brains, you know? Uh, you know where you'll end up in, the, in jail, that's where you'll end up. Uh, I, what I do is I start saying with the word I, I said, I am angry when I see this uh, mess on the floor after I just cleaned up the room, I get mad, I get furious. And by the way, and here I use another principle. I use long, big English words because I would like them to acquire a, a good vocabulary. So I not only say I'm, I'm mad, I say I am appalled. I am dismayed. I am chagrined. <laughs> I, I am full of consternation. And I think it's really important to put it into context here, which is it's perfectly valued, uh, valid to be sad or angry or happy in a classroom setting, as long as you're not taking it out on a kid, because people need to see you as a human being and not as a robot, because otherwise they're not going to be able to relate to you or see you as a figure who can help teach them. This is very obvious, but obviously if a kid does something that upsets you and you say, hey, that's really upsetting to me, the chances of them doing that again lessen versus if you just yell at them and tell them like how messed up they are as an individual, the chances of them repeating that behavior is going to go up. And there is, it, it is so interesting, I think, again, like thinking big picture from his own time, th that was probably a later clip from the 60s, perhaps the early 70s, just based on the color or whatever. But to think mm -hmm. about the restorative practices, the origins of critical pedagogies, the origins kind of of modern progressive education. So, right, Dewey at the turn of the century than really the critical pedagogy movement in the 60s beyond. But then connecting that to today's restorative practices, that's what he's talking about on a, on a main stage. And I think we're living in that backlash to, you know, so-called so supposed social justice um, and restorative practice permissiveness here today, right? Because a, a lot of people are blaming so societal unrest and all these things on, oh, it's these um, loosey-goosey kumbaya social justice restorative practices that are leading kids to not have consequences for their actions. And Heim's talking about what we would consider restorative practices today that we are receiving that conservative backlash for. And the response isn't just to shrivel up and go away. It's to say how historically important these movements have been and how we've had these conversations endlessly. And the evidence always sides with restoration rather than humiliation and authoritarianism. It's quite literally a human restoration project. Hey, that's our thing, right? Going into schools and not only talking about how do you talk with kids, but how do you create systems in which kids can be listened to and valued and heard, et cetera? Because the, it's one thing to treat kids with respect when you go throughout your day and then taking that to the next level. It's like, well, how do I do that when I do traditional grading? How do I do that when I do traditional discipline? And the answer is it's really hard. Because those things go completely in the face of respecting kids. So we have to change those systems as well. I wanted to also reference his, I guess, most recent book. He published three books. Again, two were on parenting. One was on teaching. This is the teaching book, which I, I believe is out of print. You can see how old school this looks. Ostensibly, Teacher and Child is a book that has all of these little short scenarios, most of them replicating that same mantra of, respect kids, listen to them, validate their feelings, and tone it down. He took the exact same stuff he spoke about in his parenting book and applied it to teacher scenarios. A lot of people on the right see progressive education as instilling values of social justice in the kids, and that you're forcing them to learn a certain way, forcing them to have certain opinions. That's really not the case. Uh, it's actually helping kids think for themselves and not telling them what they should think, and then coming to the conclusion that makes the most sense and then teaching them like digital media literacy, stuff like that. So there's this part here where he has this, this quote about war about peace. And he says that in a social studies class, they have Raul, who's 15. They're saying that they should quit the United Nations. It accomplishes nothing. It's full of bull. I love that, by the way. It is full of bull. Uh, all it does is talk, talk, talk. The teacher then tears into him saying, you are talk talking nonsense. You're too young to understand. What do you know about the UN? Have you read any books on it? Don't you know that without the UN, there is no hope for peace? Cannot that explains this teacher may be a strong supporter of the UN and its peace mission, but in his reply to Raoul, he started a new war. His attack incited hate, ignited fury, and invited counterattack, 
even under provocation, a teacher does not belittle children. He responds with dignity to the feeling and content of their message. I see you have strong feelings about the UN. You are deeply disillusioned with, it, with its performance and disheartened by its failure to act. Still, what's our, what's our alternative? They're, they're not instilling opinions into kids. No progressive educator is telling kids what to think. It's doing exactly this. It's empowering kids to think for themselves. It just turns the behavior or the expression into a conversation, be it in parenting or in the classroom, because right, th that's the whole point is to investigate these things and come to conclusions. Again, ignore irrelevant behaviors, but anything else is the invitation to a conversation. Well, why is it that you feel that way? Why is it that you acted like this? Why is it that, that there's this? How can we coexist in this space together? That's really all Haim is asking for. And it's really a shame that he's not uh, credited or um, his books aren't republished um, and reissued. And the other contemporary too that we didn't mention before, but this is really similar to what John Holt was talking about. I, I have oh, right on. A, a ah, copy of I would How not Children have Holt in uh, there. Learn, also How Children Fail, both published by John Holt, which I, I wanted to bring up here another example from Gannat, which is what he calls congruent communication, which is based on finding ways to not just tell exactly kids what to do, but give them a task where they're self-directed. And he uses this example from, I'm not sure to pronounce this gentleman's name, it's Jacob S. Kunin, maybe, um, okay. about discipline and classroom management. They, they talk about this idea of almost like tight transitions, uh, having kids go through a step-by-step -step process. In this case, they're transitioning from spelling books to arithmetic. And you can see they've numbered out one through 10 every single step, and every single kid is going through those steps together. And Gannat writes that the 10 commands were unnecessary and unhelpful because they engendered resentment and slowed down learning. Instead, you should have a succinct announcement. Now it's time for arithmetic, the assignments on page 16, which gives kids autonomy and invited cooperation. And then he says that the teacher says about this, I deliberately avoid provoking defensive responses in the classroom. I, my communication emits pressure phases like you must or you had better and just winning cooperation uh, like don't, don't make demands, right? You just let kids think for themselves how to get to that point because otherwise this is super dehumanizing. Yeah. Look at this last quote. I've given, I've given up polemics in my classroom. My arguments only brought counter arguments to justify defiance and postpone compliance. It is easier to gain cooperation by changing moods than by changing minds. There's some serious wisdom there, right? A lot of times, um, as educators, we it, it may not even be deliberate, but kids want to exercise their autonomy and their agency, and they want to save face among their peers, especially if you know you're redirecting them or calling them out in public too. So, doing things like this and issuing commands simply invites a struggle. Another point he makes, and this is, I think, a good summary of the thing he says in those videos, which is that labeling is disabling. It is very similar to what Alfie Cohn talks about as well. Heralds of praise, that that's definitely an Alfie Cohn. Maybe not that exact word, but that uh, notion, you know. Praise is destructive, praise is productive, and both statements are true. Evaluative praise is destructive, appreciative praise is productive. He says, you know, in psychotherapy, a child is never told you are a good little boy or you're doing great, carry on with your good work. Judgmental praise is avoided because it's not helpful, it creates anxiety, invites dependency, and evokes defensiveness. It is not conducive to self-reliance, self-directed, and self-control. These qualities demand freedom from outside judgment, and they rely on inner motivation and evaluation, which is like ungrading slash progressive education 101. And so he just goes through, I mean, uh, people can just read the book um, if they want uh, the, the we'll super the close the example. Description. Yeah, we'll put a link in the description, I guess, the thrift books. Again, I don't think this is published anymore. Used copies are only available for $35. So wow. definitely grab it while you uh, while you can. I'm sure your Get library it has it if you're interested in finding it. Yeah, any, any final thoughts about Heim Gannat? This was the deepest dive that I've gotten into his actual work, um, his videos, um, you know, I'm familiar with some of his other stuff, but I really just have a much greater appreciation for the, how he was ahead of his time, how he was a public figure in his time. I mean, sitting across the couch from Barbara Walters, it's cool to know that we can anchor ourselves in people like Gannat who came before us. You know, we're, we're always trying to um, stand on the shoulders of giants. So thanks for taking us down this uh, this journey today, Chris. And I think I'll, I'll just end with this, this again from his obituary here in the New York Times. 
substitute perhaps uh, parents for teachers as well, because he saw a lot of similarities between the two. Uh, they, they write, Dr. Gannat said it was within the parents' province to use either torture or inspiration that came down to humanizing or dehumanizing the child. Thanks so much for watching. Remember to like, share, subscribe, and leave a comment with how you think we can make school more humane. And we've got a funding drive going on too. We'll drop some details on Friday of this week. Be sure to follow it there. Thanks so much.